Hey, everybody. Welcome back. A uh, couple days away. Opening day, just two days away uh, from today. Uh, lots to talk about. Going to have a former teammate of my, uh, mine on. You're going to want to hear this one. We're going to, it's going to be probably a multi part uh, interview. Uh, but a former teammate of mine uh, is going to join me and we're going to talk baseball and talk 93 Phillies and, and modern day game and some rule stuff. Uh, and if you're a baseball player, a uh, position player, you're going to want to pay attention because this guy was probably one of the best base runners that ever played the game. And he gives you some some tips and hints about it. So uh, we're going to. Hey, Bill, how you doing, buddy? I'm doing great. Kurt. Looking forward to hearing from Dave and uh, this should be fun. Hey, I'm excited. It, it's getting there. A lot of. A lot of news, a lot of stuff going on. We're going to, I, I want to kind of hit on, since this will be the last show before spring training, I want to kind of hit on some stuff, Bill, that, that, uh, uh, and I've asked Bill to kind of present me with a couple questions, four or five questions uh, that are going through fans' minds. And, and, and as you get ready for opening day for fantasy guys, uh, this is the biggest week of the season. Um, don't draft anybody that's coming off of spring training on the injured list. Uh, because they're not going to have a full season. And nine times out of 10, when they start the season on the injured list, they are going to be behind all year long. Rare exceptions, but expect it. So, all right, Bill, what's going on? So uh, I, I took a look at the whole league in, in AL and NL. Uh, first question for you, can Chris Sale stay healthy all year and regain his status as one of the best pitchers in the league? Uh it's kind of an answer itself question. I don't know if he can. Um, if he does, he will redeem himself. Uh, you look at the guy's numbers when he's healthy. He's a he's a premium ace. He's a he's a opening day ace. He's a he's a one game play in ace. Uh, he's a swing and miss guy on the. Uh, I mean, his number, his strikeout to walk ratio, and his walk, strikeout innings pitch is stratospheric. Um, I think with baseball uh, tightening its as overall tightening its hold on starting pitchers and, and workload, uh, they'll be cautious. They'll be careful with them. Um, I would imagine uh, from a fantasy perspective, I would imagine you're talking about a guy who won't be active on the roster at the end of the year, even if he's healthy, because I think he'll have an innings limit um, because the sabermetric guys are huge on that. They don't want your workload to go over some X percentage and teams are different with it um from year to year from year over year and you're seeing young pitchers manage like that so uh yes he can i hope he stays healthy he's fun to watch he's a, he's a, he's a he's a guy you buy a ticket to watch um and if he does yes he'll redeem himself because i think he's looked very good in the spring uh and uh, for red Sox fans I, i'm not sure there's going to be a lot to be excited about this year but that's one of them good deal i'm going to stay in the al east how will the yankees pitching staff handle april with the injuries, especially to Carlos Rodon? Uh, I have no idea. I honestly don't. I, I, I don't care. Uh, I'm not saying they can't. I'm, I'm just saying, but, but I would tell you this. Uh, and I, I, you know, if you're a Yankee fan, thank the Lord Aaron Boone is your manager because Aaron Boone is, in addition to being one of God's good people, uh, the guy can run a clubhouse like nobody I've ever been around. And in that environment, in that city, that is probably the most important job of the manager. Uh, just and for for insight, guys, for the most part, <clears throat> with few exceptions, and there are managers don't manage the games. Managers make the announcements of the decisions of coaches that manage the games. And by that, I mean your bench coach. Most managers will hire a bench coach who is the organizer. Terry Fricona had Brad Mills. Brad Mills was a United States Marine. Brad Mills ran spring training like clockwork. He, Brad, Brad Mills had a huge baseball IQ. As a manager, you have a coach you rely on to make in-game decisions. Your pitching coach maybe sometimes, but it's rarely the manager making all the decisions. You want your manager to manage your players, especially in New York. And that's you, not – the the New York papers, the New York media is going to make headlines out of nothing, so don't give them something. And Aaron Boone has been a huge, huge plus for that. But I don't know. I really don't. I I – uh, it, it speaks to what, well, here's, let's, we're going to, we're going to talk about this a couple of different times. The balance schedule kind of changes everything because instead of in April, when you had Toronto six times and Tampa Bay eight times, um, you'll have those teams that many times for the season. 
Now you're replacing a three-game series in Tampa or Toronto with a three-game series in Kansas City or Oakland. Um, yeah, that's that's going to be a huge change. And for the Yankees, it'll be a big change. Here's the thing. The Yankees are built to have to win a World Series. Anything else is a failure. And, and that's how, I mean, God bless them. Brian Cashman has been under that pressure forever. Um, things won't change. They, what they can't do. And, and this is, this is as a, as a fan, the only thing you want to happen in April is that your team doesn't bury itself. Right. It, it, a lot of, a lot of fans don't understand when your game's behind, uh, you're relying on other people to win and lose when your game's ahead, it's all up to you, but you don't want a five and 15 April or a five and 25 or a 10, especially a good team, obviously. And I'm stating the obvious, but there's a certain number of wins in April that if you don't get there, you're not making the playoffs. Expanded playoff schedule is going to change things dramatically. The, the, the balance schedule is going to change things dramatically. I don't think for the better. I think a divisional heavy schedule is always a good thing. Um, but for the Yankees, they need to survive April until these guys come back healthy and are around. You, you want to get to mid-May, be in the middle. If you're in the middle pack, fine. Uh, and then you can make a run with Redone and those guys coming back. I don't know. Severino thing is going to be interesting because I'm not sure. I think that's going to be a while. Good deal. Uh, how hard is it to repeat? And can the Braves do it? Uh, how hard is it to repeat? I have no idea. Never did it. Um, I would argue that it's probably, I, I would say without a doubt, probably the hardest sport to repeat in. Um, even though, uh, I, I mean, you look at at uh, the Braves in the 90s uh, who won, what did they win? 15, 16 straight division titles, uh, one World Series. Um, the Indians in the late 90s should have multiples. That's To me, that's what makes the Yankee thing so amazing. That, that 97, 98, 99 run, or 98, 99, 2000 run um, is, is incomprehensible to me as a player. Uh, I played in four World Series, blessed to play in four of them. Uh, 1993, then eight years later, then three years later, then three years later. Uh, no team that I was ever on come late May had, a, had a, in my opinion, uh, we did... Arizona, we got hurt late. Gonzo went down late in the year, and RJ and I were hurt on and off during the season. Uh, or no, oh two, oh two. We 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 had a good series, but our, Gonzo got hurt late in the year in the postseason. In 04, we got to the playoffs. Uh, or 05, we got to the playoffs, and you know the White Sox won it that year. Um, we had to play through the end of the season to get in. I, I remember pitching that last day against the Indians uh, or against the Yankees with the Indians needing a win or a loss. Um, but we ended up getting in, getting swept by, by the White Sox in the series. I never got the pitch in, but I don't, I, I can't imagine it. it. It takes an enormous amount of talent, but probably twice as much luck to avoid injuries and stupid stuff. Um, you know, uh, in the middle of a pennant race and your best player gets brought up on charges of, of sexual assault, stuff like that. Um, which in today's day and age, now it's gone to in the middle of a pennant run and your shortstop says something on Twitter uh, and is immediately throttled by the cancel culture. Uh, and, and unfortunately, those are the things, those are going to happen. Those are going to happen. And surprisingly, still players are getting caught doing PEDs, which blows me away uh, that people are that stupid. Um, but yeah, if you can avoid that stuff, for year after year after year. And this, these, these are nine-month seasons, guys. This goes from February to, to late, late October if you're a winner. Um, that's amazing to avoid that in a year, much less three, two, three, four years. So, yeah, really, really hard. Let's look at the NL West. Everybody's talking Dodgers. Everybody's talking Padres. The Arizona Diamondbacks have the Rookie of the Year candidate in Corbin Carroll. Their pitching staff looks really strong. <laughs> it, it's interesting how they're going to play in that loaded division. Here's why it's interesting. First of all, I agree with you. I think uh, Arizona and Baltimore are probably the two youngest, most talented teams on, on the planet. When I, I'm talking from a prospect perspective. But no team, I think, 
Uh, well, actually, no. I think those two teams, Arizona and Baltimore, will be impacted by the new schedule, I think, more than any team in baseball. Um, instead of, again, instead of six games against the Dodgers, you're now going to Pittsburgh for six games, right? I, I, I think it's going to have a dramatic impact. Um, you know, uh, division winning, uh, barring massive injuries to San Diego, Atlanta, guys, no, or San Diego, LA guys, no. Um, what potential wild card? Absolutely. Uh, a lot of things have to break right. If I'm a betting man, I'm very comfortable putting a futures pick on uh, uh, on Carroll to win the rookie of the year. Uh, I, I my my pick early on was the uh, painter kid from from Philadelphia, but he's going to start on the IL. So fantasy. If you're not in a keeper league uh, or dynasty league uh uh painter's the guy to stay away from unfortunately uh and i say that with a heavy heart because i want to see the kid pitch but coming out of spring training behind the eight ball is just not a, a good solution i love arizona's makeup uh but uh i think the games against the dodgers and padres are going to be where it's at and i think that, that one of those two teams uh is going to be on top of that division uh, the giants I don't know what the Giants are. Um, uh, the The Rockies are the Rockies. And now that Colorado, they've tried to make Colorado a neutral field, which I don't think is a great thing, by the way. Um, I think it's Dodgers Padres. And, and, and the Diamondbacks fit in there somewhere. I, I think the Diamondbacks are in third place. Wild card, I don't know, possibly. Um, and then you've got uh, the Giants and then the Rockies, unfortunately. Joining me now... Uh, I'm going to start with uh, a great friend first. Uh, uh, he was a phenomenal teammate and I, and I'm going to everything, trust me when I tell you everything you hear after this is going to be said in a very loving tone. Uh, it might not sound loving, but he knows exactly what I mean. Uh, a former teammate, a uh, great, great friend of mine, uh, third baseman, Dave Hollins, Headley Hello. What's up, Shill? It's How so are... good to see you, my friend. How you doing? I'm good. Good. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. No, it's a it's a pleasure. I know this is just right up your alley. You love doing stuff like <laughs> this. <so. laughs> yeah. For those that don't know, Dave was a, a very quiet guy as a player. Uh, he was two things. Uh, it, and I always say this when I rank well, three things, actually, when I rank my teammates about uh, when it comes to like intensity and toughness and all the things that I talk about, Dave was probably the most intense. Uh, uh, him and Randy Johnson were probably one and one A for intensity for me because randy's wasn't fake um and dave's was definitely not when it, when it, the game was on um and the toughest uh quick story when what was it 90 it was 93 93 was it yeah so dave breaks his hand um ham ate bone right and then uh uh our doctor goes in in philadelphia and mangles the surgery but you're talking usually six to eight weeks for most guys. Headley comes on uh, seven. I, I think it was within three weeks, 17 days, some insane number after that. He's at the plate hitting left-handed with a steel pin sticking out of his hand. Um, understanding in my mind that at the time, what I thought was he believed he was more valuable in the lineup, even if he was 50% than he was out of it. And, and it was true because if you look at his career stats, he was a guy who was a sabermetric darling before they existed. Career thrift, 358 on base percentage in uh, 93, I think. Yeah, 372 and 98 when he had, uh, after having a monster season in, or 93, after having a monster season in 92. Um, I want to I want to touch real quick because I know the story and I think it's fascinating. Talk to me about your mentality. You were a very intense, uh, very old school at a time when I think the last era of old school players was coming up, right? They We had to do things as young players and, and get hazed and all the things that went with that, even though I remember you skipping the hazing. Um, I, <laughs> but talk to me about that intensity, where that came from and, and how it came to be and how you used that when you played and your thoughts looking back on it. Well, as you know, that's not something you just pick up. I mean, that, no. that's, that's the way I was taught to play the game at a young age through my, you know, father and, and older brothers. How, you had five brothers? I had three brothers. Three brothers, three brothers. Four boys and three girls, but I was the second youngest. And, uh, 
you know, taking losses and, and poor performances lightly just really wasn't accepted <laughs> at that time, right or wrong. That's just the way we, we took sports right. very seriously. And it went from there as the stakes got higher and you moved up in uh, college and pro ball. Uh, that just continued. And I, right. Some reason for me, I always want to come back as a finesse player in my next lifetime. I think it's a lot more fun. <laughs> Whenever I try to enjoy myself or have fun and 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 relax more, the game seemed to punish me, and uh, and and it didn't work out well. So it almost forced me into being right. more intense and serious than I really needed to be, right. uh, which I found out later in my career. But when you're playing in Philadelphia after a hall of famer uh, at a position that they had their, you know, probably their best position player ever. At. It, one of the, yeah, probably one of the 10 best players ever, by the way. Yeah. And, and by the way, you were, you were, you were circled by hall of famers. You came after one and played before one. Yeah. Scotty Rowland yeah. was uh, an amazing player. Uh, yeah. And, and luckily, you know, he's in the hall of fame now. Yeah. With, yeah. We're, I'm so happy for him. You, yeah. you obviously belong with oh, him. Oh, thank so. you, thank you. Uh, yeah. We all, no, we all it, know it, that it, who played I, with you. So you know what? I want to I want to talk about uh, you as a player. Um, I, I've said it often, uh, and I told you this uh, recently. In my 20 some years, I, I always have these these lists of players. You know, uh, most athletic and all this other stuff, and. And I think it was, re and, and the, I think most of the things that I say were recognized inside the game by other players. Uh, and I say to this day, uh, you, Scott Rowland, and, and Jeff Bagwell were the best base runners that I've ever seen. And by that, I mean, anytime you could be a base ahead of where everybody else would be, you were. You didn't make dumb outs on the bases. You always knew the situation on the bases. And part, part of that gets back to your intensity because you were focused. But you had stolen bases. And, and, I mean, you didn't steal a lot in your career, but you were never in the wrong place on the bases. And and th and that's something that's not easy, especially in the big leagues, right? Uh, understanding what field you're – like in Colorado, knowing a ground ball through the infield, you, you have to be on third base if you're on yeah. first base in Colorado. Talk to me a little bit and talk to the young players that are watching this a little bit about – your mentality as a base runner and how that came to be? Well, first of all, it's not real complicated, Shill. And as far as the stolen bases, I would add this. Remember, with Darren hitting behind me, we wanted to leave the hole open for him at first and yep. second, and I could score on a double from first. Right. So right. the risk of stealing and taking the bat out of his hands, we right. had talked that, you know, yeah, you could steal, but we'd rather you not. Well, after you That's left, why I didn't after, run a lot. Yeah. No, but after you left, you had uh, what? Yeah. Ninety-seven. You stole sixteen. I and ran was, more. When, right, when, and that was that was yeah. very. If you look at Bagwell, it was the same way. But he would have fifteen to twenty-five stolen bases, but they were opportunistic. He would steal when he knew the guy was way too slow, and he knew the catcher wasn't going. to – He would steal when Piazza was catching, or when when he knew he could get it. But he never gave away outs on the bases, and that was the thing I was marvelled at with you was first to third you were as good as anybody it wasn't about speed it was about jump reading the ball and and all the things that go with that and that's an effort chill right. the main and, thing yeah is you have to know obviously where your outfielders are you got to know this the outs the situation when you're going to risk it or not but it's it's effort i was exhausted after a game, because every time I got on base, I took a hard secondary lead and plant and was ready to go. And then after that, you have to hustle back to first or they'll pick you. A lot of guys don't want to burn that energy. It comes, it's, I believe it's as simple as that. If they yeah. don't want to burn the energy, you're not getting the secondary lead that at one extra step. And I and wasn't that's the, the game. fastest guy. No, was, that's the game. One that, step is the game. One step is the game. Now, a lot of guys want to shoot the shit at first or take a little lead. They're afraid to get picked. I took a one-way lead knowing that I could get a big secondary lead, and I did a hard plant ready to go. Now, that was effort. That was yeah. On yeah. every single pitch, I was in a position to go full speed. And that was the difference between safe, at third and out on a bang bang play 
And really, it's as simple as that. To I, me, uh, in yeah. my mind. In yeah, my no, mind, and, and it is in that sense. After and the, read the ball off the bat, obviously, that's part of it. But if you're not physically in the right position, effort-wise, it doesn't matter. Well, you're you not going to get there. Quick story for, for, for you. I never told you the story before, but it was something that, that uh, uh, Vuk mentioned to me early on when I was in Philadelphia about watching you run the bases because Vuk, Vuk was trying to teach me attention to detail. And he said, he said, I want you to watch Dave during batting practice run the bases. Yeah. And I remember watching that. And the, the thing I had the same thought as I did when I watched Cal Rickman take 100 ground balls every single day of the season, thinking this guy's as good as anybody in the game at this. Why is he working harder than people that aren't as good as him? And, and that's a thing. If you think, and and a, a, as a baseball player, I, I don't know how often they do it now, but if you watch guys, that's where guys take their, that's where guys get a break during BP, yeah. run the base, go to first, get a couple leads, read the ball off the bat, run to second, whatever. That was, it was a game set mindset in your, excuse me, watching you do that. I realized why you were such a good base because reading the baseball is instinctual off the bat and, and you'll the see you it, the better it, you are at it. Well, I don't know how much of the WBC you watch, but there was a game uh, where the, the Japanese won that game, the, the semifinal game and the runner on first was almost literally behind Otani touching the plate at home on that double in the gap that I know Otani, who, by the way, is the fastest guy down the first baseline in baseball. Amazingly. Right. But this guy, and you watch the slow, the camera on him, his jump was phenomenal. He read the ball perfectly off the bat. And that happened. That only happens if you're paying attention during batting practice and watching ball flight and watching and understanding. And like Dave said, I, I always paid attention to the guys on first who would look behind to find the outfielders. I, you know, I need to know where I'm going to go and, and the things like that. And I just, I don't know. I, I, it, it's one of those things. It's a lost art. And yeah. guys that are good at it now really stick out. And I don't think that's a good thing. So I don't either. Let okay. me ask you this about the the new rules. Give me your impression, uh, which, and I'm not a fan of them, but whatever. Um, you're a base runner now. And, and how does your mentality change when the pitcher can only throw over twice? Right. And then yeah. the third time, if you don't get picked off, it's a balk. Right. Well, I, I'm shocked I, at it because you, you would you, – for me, I would be getting a bigger lead to force a throwover. Absolutely. But the extra size of the bases, I'm going to be looking to run more, which, right. you know, I'm, I, I guess that that's the result they want. Right. They want more offense and more stealing of bases. I'm more concerned about the pitch count rushing the pitchers and hitters. I think it's a little tight. Yeah. I think it could go to 25 or 30 just to – not to take away all the elements of the game, right. which, as you know, a pitcher holding the ball is a strategy. Can, is a strategy against a runner, and it can also affect. It bothered me as a hitter when a guy kept holding the ball. Yep. You know, because you can't stand out. in that ready position. You no, know, you, you just can't. And no. it was part of the game inside the game that they're taking away. Yeah. Because for some reason they're in a hurry. Well, I understand. Over with. I understand their thought. I don't agree with it. They want the game over faster. They want yeah. the game to move quicker. They want. They think that's going to bring younger people to the game to watch the game, blah, blah, blah. I disagree that it's going to do any of those things. What I do know is this, and it might be a good thing. With this pitch clock, we, we wouldn't have had Joe Carter's home run. We wouldn't have had Kirk Gibson's home run. Uh, there are an enormous number of postseason moments that wouldn't exist. I never even thought of that. Yeah, because if you think, if you go back and watch these, these at-bats, the, the the beauty of them is the yeah. time. In between you got Vince Scully with Eckersley <laughs> against Gibson. That that at bat went full count. Right. If you watch it, it's like a five minute at bat almost. Fouled That's off, quick. runner coming back. Those were, too quick. Yes. It, yes. I think it could be mediated or, or negotiated to maybe thirty, where there's a right. little more time, and we still cut the games down a oh, little yeah. bit. But you're not taking a, you're not rushing the players. Yeah. I mean, that's, it's, it's had the intended impact in the sense of the game shorter, yeah. but I, I don't know that it's made the product better. Um, and, and like I said, you, what, you know, people are like, Oh, you just get rid of it for the postseason. You can't do that. You got to play with the same rules you play with all year. That's why, you know, that that's why the designated hitter thing I've always felt was a cheat 
and wrong. It, it, you know, you got half the game building a roster with the DH and half the game without, and those two are going to play for the championship at the end. Right. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm not, I'm not a fan. So um, the other one I want to talk to you about, because I know the answer to this before I even ask you uh, the shift, which wasn't a thing when we played, it, it happened rarely, but I played with David Ortiz and watched his batting average, probably five to 10 points lower than it would have been without it. Yeah. Um, but I always marveled at the guys who refused to go the other way. And, and I listen, before I say that, I'm not saying that like it's easy. It's not. I get it. It's very hard. But if the ultimate goal is for your team to win, don't you as a hitter do whatever it is to make yourself the best possible hitter you can be? Yeah. It, it's And it goes all the way back to the type of players they're drafting and what they're placing an emphasis on. Right. Power, swinging up at the ball, launch angle. Now you get those guys to the major leagues and you ask them to go the other way. They can't do it. No, it's not fair to them. Players who can hit and hit down on the ball, even the power hitters, a lot, most of them hit down on the ball. Right. Use the whole field. Well, you can't shift on them. Right. You just, or you can't shift as effectively. I always said, and, and I really believe this, I always told, and, and Ortiz and I talked about that. I, I always said, if you bunt four times in one game, they'll stop. Because Manny's hitting behind him. Yeah. And he had that protection. And he wasn't a slow guy. He wasn't fast by any means, but but he wasn't a base blogger. But, but how many guys, and, and you can tell, I always looked at the guys who bunted against that as guys I wanted to play with. He understands the game. Games get on base. Yeah, I get on base. I can't score if I don't get on base. And I, so, and I said the same thing. What's going to, it's going to be ironic. I think, I think the teams are going to switch and have the off outfielder as a utility player. And he'll come in and play the infield as the fifth infielder. Cause that's not against the rules. And they'll leave, they'll, they'll spread the outfield over to the shift. But, but I think it might end up forcing guys to hit the ball the other way. If you got to the plate and knew there wasn't a guy in left field as a, as a left-handed hitter, yeah. You're doing everything you can. That, that's that's playground ball again. You run till it gets past the cones. Yeah. You know? And so I, I think that might have the intent, uh, an unintended effect, which will be good for baseball. So, um, I so I, hey, listen, first of all, uh, it's always good to talk to you. Yeah. I, I really appreciate you taking the time. I do, uh, uh, I will be down to see Bo. So for those of you that don't know, I've you've heard me talk about Bo on the show. Um, his son, uh, his, well, both of his boys are professional baseball players. Um, Bo is, uh, and Bubba, who is named after Darren Dalton, that was such his nickname. Um, but, Bo, uh, Bo is a junior in high school in South Carolina. Uh, and he's the first player I've honestly seen. And I, I, you know, I don't watch a ton of college or high school baseball, obviously, but he's the first player I've seen in my lifetime, uh, well, over the last five or 10 years that has Otani skill set. Uh, and I, and I'm not, he doesn't throw a hundred and, and, but, uh, he is a six foot four inch built like his dad has literally no body fat. It's annoying as hell. Um, <laughs> six, four, about two twenty five, left-handed pitcher. He will be, uh, a, 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 I think an insanely high pick in the draft after next year. Um, you know, whether he goes to college or plays pro ball, uh, you know, that's a conversation they'll have another day, but, uh, if you're a South Carolina high school baseball fan and you don't get out to see this kid, it's River Bluff, right? Yes. River uh, if, you, Bluff. if you don't get out to see this kid, and I'm pretty sure I'm not going to be saying anything. Scouts don't already know because he's jumped all, uh, all over it this year. Uh, nine home runs in 11 games, first 11 games of the season. He had nine and eight. So he's in a huge slump. He hasn't homered in three games. <laughs> um, but he's a special kid. And most importantly to me, uh, one, he has an insanely high baseball IQ. But two, he's a good man. And, and that to me is obviously Dave, it's, it's a byproduct of growing up uh, with Dave's wife, Carrie, who's one of the greatest human beings you'll ever know, especially knowing she grew up, lived with Dave for all this time and right. they're still <laughs> together. That's just uh, uh, awesome. Uh, but uh, he's a special kid and Bo Holland, B-E-A-U. If you haven't heard the name, you will uh, trust me. So um, Dave, listen, thank you again, buddy. It's always great to see you. I love you to death. Uh, and I'm looking forward to coming down and seeing Bo uh, play show at some point soon. Thank you, Shil. Love you too, brother. Take Enjoy. care. All right, you too. Hey guys, um, 
good stuff. Stay tuned for for the next episode for more from from Dave Collins. We talked for for a long time, uh, and it was a great conversation. So we're going to close the show out, Bill. Um, next time we talk, games will be real. Um, and there's some great stories. This was always uh, a very weird time of the year in the sense that when I was a young player, it was about, oh, my God, who's going to make the roster? Uh, and as I got older and became more established, it was about, you know, oh, my God, I need to be ready for spring training on the first day of camp. And not, you know, you you, you go from going to spring training to get ready for the season to getting ready for the season, then going to spring training. Um, but the stories out of this are always awesome. Um I'll tell you, Bill, real quick. In in when I was in the minor leagues, the, the Red Sox were old school. They used to announce their minor league rosters with like like the high school band. They would put in the locker room at Winter Haven. There were uh, six teams. There were six rows of lockers, and on cut day, you would come in, and there would be a paper with the roster on it. And if your name wasn't on it, you weren't you 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 packed your shit and went home. Like it was cal- cold. And I remember, and I remember this vividly because we had a guy that I played with who used to make it a point. He was so talented. He knew he was going to make a team. He would go there early just to sit and watch people get cut. And he, it was just horrific. But I remember in 1988, I was in, in 87, I was in Greensboro, which was low A ball. Uh, and I was getting ready to go to Winter Haven uh, the next year uh, in 88. And on cut down day, I went to look. And my name was not on the Winter Haven roster. And I was breathless. And I don't know why. I, I was like looking and somebody said something to me about like, what's wrong? And I'm like, I'm not here. He goes, well, of course you're not there. You're on the New Britain roster, which was the double A team. And I, making that jump, which at the time guys didn't usually do that. You you went Greensboro winner. But I, I remember that very vividly. But that moves over into stories. Now we're talking about guys. There've been a couple of really cool stories of guys being told they're making the roster. Those are happening every year, but um, <clears throat> three, three stories we want to touch on uh, always fascinated by uh, the Yankees and what they do at the end of camp. Uh, when was the last time? Was it Jeter in 95? It was. Yeah. He, he was uh, 20 ro- years old. Yeah. Uh, a rookie broke a rookie shortstop broke camp with the New York Yankees, and we all know how that ended. Uh, Anthony Volpe apparently was good enough. Uh, three seventeen with three homers, hit like ten extra base hits, um, and he's going to open the season as the starting shortstop for the New York Yankees. Uh, here's the only reason I'm not nervous if I'm a Yankee fan. Aaron Boone knows people. And there's no doubt in my mind this would not be happening if they didn't think he was going to be able to handle everything that comes his way because they're going to be talking to him and asking him questions about Jeter every day of the season, uh, especially when that first slump hits. Um, excuse me. And it'll be interesting to see. So uh, uh, that's a good one. And, I mean, this is a team built to win the World Series. So he's not expect. they're not – this isn't a, we're going to come in and break you in and just take your time. This is, uh, uh, you heard, uh, you'll hear Dave and I talk about winning. Uh, on the Yankee roster, you're not being paid to play. You're being paid not just to win, but to win a World Series. Different set of expectations. Um, the favorite, My favorite story this spring so far has been uh, uh, the Cardinals. Uh, Jordan Walker, who, uh, um, number one pick last year? First round, I don't... First round. Yeah, he was the Cardinals' number one pick. Yeah, he was the Cardinals' uh, number one pick. 20 years old. He is uh, breaking camp with the big leagues. Now, the reason this is kind of uh, uh, a shock um, is because he's a third baseman, and anybody that knows baseball knows that St. Louis, once again, has the best fielding third baseman in baseball in Nolan Arenado. Um, Walker hit 295 with three homers. Uh, ran, he's a, he's a five-tool guy, but... Um, athletic enough that they can move him to the outfield and he could be a big league outfielder. That's not normal. That's insane athletic ability. This kid's going to be a special player. Probably the antithesis of breaking into the New York market is breaking into St. Louis. The best fans on the planet from a, from a St. Louis Cardinal perspective, they're smart. They're Midwest folk. They love their Cardinals. They're going to do everything they can do 
to support this kid and hope he does well. They'll boo eventually, uh, but I don't think he's going to be booable. Uh, I think no matter what, he has a tool set that that uh, thrives. The, the issue for me, if I'm the Cardinals, is making sure he gets his at-bats. He's 20 years old. He needs to be at the plate. And if they're going to – I don't believe they would keep him – uh, to play him once a week, but I don't believe they're going to keep him to play six days a week. I think uh, three or four starts a week, uh, a, an enormous asset off the bench. Uh, and I here's here's why I think it's going to be potentially incredibly valuable. The new shift rules. You're going to see uh, outfielders being brought into the infield as a fifth infielder, whether it be on the left side or the right side of the infield. This is a natural Right. If you if you're playing a team with multiple guys, you're going to shift on whether whatever outfield position Jordan Walker's playing, he becomes your fifth infielder and you take the off outfielder out of the outfield. You shift your center fielder over to cover that gap and you shift your right field or the other. I don't care. But but that's why uh, I think that the Cardinals recognizing the new rules, in addition to wanting him to get at bats, did this. Um, and it's going to be fascinating to watch how that plays out. Uh, lastly, ever, before we get to the Brave story, did you ever play with any 20 or 21 year old kids on your teams? Uh, I can't remember how. Oh, yeah, I did. Uh, uh, I just can't remember. Uh, Clay Buckholtz, uh, John Lester wasn't old. Um, Jacoby Ellsbury was, was in his early 20s. I don't I don't remember 19 or 20. But. It just seems to me that that would be such an adjustment at that well, age. Yeah, but those guys are already adjusted. You're 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 talking about it. So double A is the level. At double A, that's where they decide whether you can play in the big leagues or not. Because at double A is the first time you ever see breaking balls behind in the count. Uh, you see guys mixing up count, whatever. Um, that's the first level. If you can, if you can't cut it at double A, because I mean it doesn't translate to a jump to the big leagues. But that's the first time I think a lot of teams assume you're in a competitive setting that that replicates the big leagues. You got 98 mile an hour guys, guys who throw breaking balls behind the count and whatnot. That's that. That's a double A. So I I don't think they're worried about the baseball transition. Not everybody's worried about it, but I think it's more for these young guys, especially for Volpe, how they handle the other stuff because there's a lot of other stuff that they've never dealt with coming their way. Um. Lastly, the Braves. Yeah. If you're yeah, if you're a Braves fan, uh, a couple things. Kyle Wright went on the injured list uh, after getting a cortisone shot in his shoulder. That never works. That never works out. That's not a good thing, and here's why. Uh, I, you have an inflamed bursa sac uh, in your shoulder, which is a small kind of a lubricating thing in your shoulder, uh, or an inflamed uh, labrum or so, whatever it is. The cortisone may take away the inflammation, probably usually does. Good doctors can give it, uh, and they're very painful, by the way. But the inflammation is a, call, a result of something else, and cortisone generally doesn't fix the something else, whether it's a bone chip or uh, instability in the joint. Um, those things happen, and they generally happen from top to bottom. And by that, I mean you'll have an underlying condition when you blow out your elbow. Because generally you'll blow out your elbow because there's instability in it because of the instability in the shoulder joint itself. Muscles and nerves are moving in places and ways they're not supposed to, and you it doesn't work. But I don't like cortisone shot in the shoulder because I don't think it fixes. And and there's exceptions always, but that's usually not the case. And I'm a Braves fan that bothers me uh, a lot because you're talking about what the only 20 game winner last year in the in baseball. Uh, he's scheduled to return to the Braves on April 11th. Yeah, that's not going to happen. Um, I would always uh, uh, pay attention to what he's doing. Uh, for you guys drafting, uh, a guy getting a cortisone shot this close to opening day would put him on my draft late list uh, if I draft him at all. Um, but that leads to a couple of different situations uh, for the Braves, who, by the way, are playing to win it all. Uh, so this is kind of a big thing. Um, Jared Schuster and D uh, Dylan Dodd are going to break camp in the rotation. Um, that's a big deal. They're both 24 year old rookies. Um, and they were both kind of competing for the fifth starter spot in Atlanta's camp. Now one's the four and one's the five. Um, both could 
have stuff to contend for rookie of the year. Uh, almost all pitchers coming up like this now do. Um, but if you, if you, if you ask front offices and you look around guy as a, as a front office guy, you go like this, when you bring a, a starting pitcher up and put them in your fifth spot in your rotation, I'm not sure if you go like this, if you bring two guys up and put them in the fourth and fifth spot as rookies. Um, but there it is. Uh, having said that, Go back over the last 30 years. What team has developed young pitching better than anybody on the planet? Um, in the background of that news, Mike Soroka is not in the big leagues. Uh, and that deserves an enormous, huh? Um, but his spring training didn't warrant it. And and uh, Soroka fans probably uh, should be concerned. Braves fans should be concerned. But they're going to break with young pitchers. And again, it's almost like cardinal position players. Uh, I trust the Braves to do right by young pitching. I always have, and they always have. Um, that philosophy has carried on since the 90s with that rotation. So those are your spring training stories. Next time uh, you hear my voice, uh, baseball will count. It'll be for real. There'll be a pitch clock. You'll see these uh, goofy-ass bases um, that you think people are just throwing down on the field and all the things go with that, and and the pace of game will be quicker. Next time you hear my voice, uh, the games will be real. Everything will count, and fantasy leagues everywhere will kick off. Uh, I would tell you again, if you're a fantasy owner, wait till your Wednesday for your fantasy draft. You'll have much less pain that way. For all of you that have already drafted, good luck. But next time we talk, it'll all be for real. Bill, have a good one. I'll talk to you again in a couple of days.